So hello and welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session, which is Copyright and OER, Outlining the Issues with Carla Myers. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm the Publishing Director at the Open Textbook Network. If you're not already familiar with us, we're a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OTN. I will be serving as today's facilitator. Please ask your questions as you have them in the Q&A, and we will try to make this a conversation as best we can. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few important details with you. We're live tweeting our sessions, so please join us on Twitter. Our handle is at open underscore textbooks. And the hashtag for the summit is OTN Summit 20. This session is being recorded. The video and transcripts will be posted on the Open Textbook Network's YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn dot edu slash summit community norms. You can see there my colleague Sarah Cohen is sharing these details in the chat. Please join us in creating our safe and constructive space. Finally, I just want to point out there is a button for live transcript at the bottom right of the Zoom toolbar. If you would like to turn on auto captioning for this session, you can using that button. So, Please join me now in welcoming today's presenter, Carla Myers. Carla serves as Assistant Professor and Coordinator of Scholarly Communications for the Miami University Libraries in Ohio. Her professional presentations and publications focus on library and educational copyright issues, as well as open educational resource creation and use. As I mentioned, today Carla is going to outline the issues around copyright and OER. So I'll hand things over to you now, Carla. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for um, to everybody who is joining us today. It's I'm so excited to have this conversation with you all for a variety of reasons. Um, number one, both of these topics are very near and dear to my heart. Um, not only as a copyright librarian, which I've been working in this field for about 15 years. But the other major role I have at Miami University is promoting affordable education and open education. So to get to bring these two together um, is a treat for me. But to also have this conversation within the context of our community, because I think there's um, I think there's there, there's a lot of confusion around copyright in general. Um, I remember when I first started working with the law, struggling with so many of the misconceptions or misrepresentations that are out there. And I think these are sometimes quantified when we're talking about publishing and putting these things out there more broadly as versus classroom use. So anytime I get to have a conversation about these, um, it's very exciting. And then too, something I am beyond excited to work about is the guide. Um, so this presentation is, um, this presentation and I truly hope conversation is kind of based around a guide that the OTN is going to be putting together around copyright and open educational resources. So recently, while I was working with some colleagues um, in regards to copyright considerations with everybody moving to remote education in light of the pandemic, something that one of my colleagues said, and unfortunately I can't remember who said it, but that really resonated with me is that we can't skip copyright, we can't ignore it right now, these considerations are still there, but it shouldn't be our number one fear or a barrier to what we want to do. Instead, we should know what we can do and make thoughtful decisions within the context of that. And I think that really rings true for me, not only with copyright and OER in general, but especially the idea of this guide, that how can we put information out there that can help us, um, those of us who are working with OER creation, OER adaptation, um, or OER use, Help us raise our awareness of the law. Um, what do we need to know about it? But also, what does the law empower us to do? What does it allow 
um, educa educators and students, those using the OER stew? And how can we help people make thoughtful decisions um, that aren't necessarily based out of concern or fear, but more out of understanding and an eagerness to take advantage of these user rights that are granted within the law? So within the context of that, what I want to do is today talk about kind of two key areas. Um, so copyright within the context of OER creation and then communicating license information to users so that our users understand what rights they have or the ways that they can use this open educational resource. So what I'll kind of be doing here today is share the outline as I envision it or as I've talked it through with some folks at the Open Textbook Network the outline for this guide and what it will include. Um, but I'm coming at this from the perspective of a copyright librarian. And what I'm very eager to hear is from you all. Um, your questions about the law, where you might want to see in-depth information provided. Or I think what I'm most eager to hear is your frontline examples, your situations, where have people come to you with questions? Where do you find questions in dealing with these things? Because we want this guide to be as functional as possible. Um, and the way that you share your stories or your experiences or the questions you receive or you encounter, we can make sure that information is included in this guide so that other people can benefit from what your experience is or the knowledge you've gained in working with this is. So please share your questions broadly as we go along. So taking a look at copyright in the creation of OER. Um, I think the number one thing that I see here is the creation of the OER, and this tends to come about in a multitude of ways. Um, so I think the vast majority of OER are created from the ground up. Um, so the advantage of this is, is it's truly customized content. It's content that fits the vision of the expert or experts that we are bringing in to create these OER for our community. Um, the question is, who is going to be the author of this? Is it going to be one person? Is it going to be a couple people coming together to author this? Is it going to be a multitude of people coming together? Maybe we have a couple lead authors, but then we have uh, students and other people they're bringing in, maybe into an edited volume or with case studies. Is the author actually the person who is writing the material? Is the author going to be the institution? Could this be a work made for hire situation where that all or parts of it, depending on how they're being created by employees of the institution, the ownership is actually the institution itself, not the person who is actually doing the writing. Um, who is authoring what? Do we have an editor who is helping others that they're bringing in to work on this guide? Um, their creation of content for the final open educational resource. Do we maybe have a faculty author who is creating this OER as part of um, a class and bringing student perspective and student voices into the creation of this? Do we have library and publishing staff who are going to be working on parts of this? It could be in an editorial capacity. Um, it could be in some other capacity in creating content or editing that content. Um, it could be staff that are working for our publication departments or for our uh, publishing librarians who are heading up these initiatives. And then if that's happening, what are the work made for hire situations tied to that? Could we be contracting people to uh, create things for these open educational resources? Here at Miami University, one of the OER we are hoping to get into our publishing program um, is very scientific. And we realize that in this capacity, we really need somebody with a unique skill set to create some of these scientific images or charts or graphs. And could it be that we go out and contract professionals in that capacity? And then in that situation, it could be that um, we have a license situation with them where they allow us to use those in certain capacities. Or it could be we say that this is going to be a work made for hire situation where we are hiring you, so we own the copyright. Um, so I think this is one of the unique things with open educational resources, but maybe also one of the biggest challenges too, is that in some ways this can seem very straightforward. We find a faculty member who is so eager to share their knowledge who is excited about the idea of putting this educational resource out there freely for the public to engage with. But we kind of have to dig through all of these authorship considerations to figure out, you know, where does the authorship lie? And then, of course, 
Um, I think very frequently we are working with faculty who want to use some of their previous published works. They are experts in the field. Chances are that they have been creating scholarship, whether it is articles or book chapters or books or graphical content for a while that they want to build upon within the scope of this OER. Um, of course, when they've published before, taking a look at those publication agreements, just to see what rights might have they retained, what rights might have they signed over, and how that might um, guide how we can incorporate previously published works. Um, or could there be other work made for higher situations that come into play? Maybe they created some of the content at a previous institution where work made for higher situations were a little bit different from our current institution, and we have to bring those into consideration. Um, a while back, I was talking with a friend who they were looking to do an OER publishing program at their institution and wanted to ask us about ours. And when I talked with them through all of this, they're like, Carla, what you just shared there makes me not want to do this because how do we even get started, you know, when we have all of these considerations to work through? It sounds overwhelming. It sounds scary. Um, but it's, it's, I think, like any other copyright type, type situation. Sitting down with the people who you are going to be engaging with, talking through what they want to create, where they are sourcing materials from, who is going to be involved, what special considerations do we have tied to that. And I think this is one of the reasons that I'm so excited to work with the OTN on this guide, is that we can come up with checklists, with formulas for working through and addressing all of these considerations. I think it's just knowing what do we need to be aware of in these situations and how do we make sure we're working through all of them methodically. Um, I'm curious to hear if anybody in the audience has worked through some of these. If there's considerations you've seen tied to authorship that maybe uh, I haven't identified here. Um, or if you have any questions about any authorship considerations just getting started, who is the author and what do we need to think about about what copyrights they might hold? Carla, we don't have anything in the Q&A yet, but okay. I echo your invitation. Yes, yes, please share. Um, and one thing that I will share here that um, I'm currently working on with a couple uh, colleagues is student considerations, especially within the context of a course. I love that we are seeing student voices brought into open educational resources for a variety of reasons. But when OER are being created within the scope of a course, I think there's ethical considerations we have to think about alongside the legal considerations. Um, not only when it comes to something like FERPA, which you know is a law regarding student records and how are we sharing those student records publicly, but also um, I had a conversation with a faculty member recently who said, you know, oh, well, we're going to create this OER as part of the class, and I'm just having the students transfer their copyright and everything they create over to me so that it's all easy moving forward. And I was like, well, that does make things kind of easy. But did you think about considerations for compelling students to sign their rights over to you? And, you know, the concerns or the frustrations we hear when we are sometimes compelled is part of um, maybe the journal publication process to sign our rights over to our publishers. And what kind of situation are we putting students into there? So opening up a conversation about the importance of bringing student voices into OER creation, but also ethically and legally, how do we um, make sure that we are recognizing their rights or their voices as creators and that they don't feel compelled to enter into any type of agreement, agreement that they might not have to. Um, so if anybody's had any experience or thoughts on that, I would very much welcome that as well. So Carla, we're looking, yes. We had, a, we had a, many questions come in at, at that awesome. moment. So um, on the note of student contributors, um, one attendee said, I was just going to ask about students. Is there a best practice for having students permit their use of work? We're creating an OER first year composition textbook and want to use student examples. Wonderful. I love it. And that's something my colleagues and I are trying to work on. Um, so the way I've started hand to handle it here at Miami University is I said, I love that you're bringing student voices into this, but let's make sure that these are informed decisions that the students are making. So when this situation was first brought to our attention, um, we actually brought our Office of General Counsel into the conversation. 
And something interesting that they talked about is um, students not being forced to sign a license, and this was them signing all of their rights in the work over to the faculty member, without that being disclosed before they sign up for the class. Because if students aren't comfortable with that situation, we don't want them to feel compelled to have to do that. Um, so we talked about if the course is a required course about part of the curriculum that they cannot be required to transfer copyright or that if it is even a optional course that they really shouldn't feel compelled in that situation either. So in those situations disclosing upfront as part of the class description that students will be creating works as part of the class that will be openly licensed and shared with the public. Something else we're taking a look at best practices is let me come in and talk with the students during one of the first classes. Let's talk about what does this mean to be openly licensing content. And what we're really pushing for, it's within, you know, the purview of open, um, open educational resources, openly open licenses, Creative Commons licenses, where the students get to remain the copyright holders, but that they are openly licensed their works, freely sharing them out. Something we talk about, what does that mean? Um, letting students each individually choose which um, Creative Commons license they would like to attach to their work um, that they're creating. And then, um, of course, those FERPA considerations and talking with faculty that if you have a student for whatever reason isn't necessarily comfortable sharing the work out, that they are provided an alternate assignment. Um, or that we respect that they don't want to share it in capacity with this project. Um, the vast majority of faculty I have, who I've worked with, very much understand and respect this, and it's been wonderful. Um, it's been great, too, to talk with students in this capacity. I think the number one thing that I get from students is like, well, wait a minute, I'm a copyright holder? Like, don't I have to register my work with the Copyright Office? And we talk about no, that you know, the, a second you have that original creative work, you hold the copyright in that, and then you you get these rights, and that you can share those rights without, out with other people. And it's very heartwarming as a copyright librarian to see students so eager that oh my gosh, I'm so excited to hear that I'm a rights holder, and I can't wait to share this out with other people, and especially under an open license where I can encourage them to transform this into something new. So I think best practices include talking with the faculty who are interested in doing this to make sure that we are ethically and legally respecting students' rights, making sure students are cognizant of those rights, and making sure that those students have those same flexibility and sharing and, um, and, sharing and attaching Creative Commons licenses that we are uh, providing to our faculty who are coming into our programs. Um, so what I would love to hear from the audience is what would you like to see? Maybe I love the idea of the best practices. I think that could go into a chapter as students as authors. What would you like to see highlighted in there? What questions have you heard from students or faculty so that we can make sure we are thoroughly addressing best practices or considerations for students in those documents? Thank you so much. I love that question. Um, I hope I answered that a little bit. If not, please chat back asking for more information. Carla, there are a couple of related questions. Um, do students actually need to transfer copyright or is it sufficient that they have the Creative Commons license? And can the student copyright licensing be signed over to the institution instead of faculty? Because what if the faculty should leave? Um, and then also I'll just add a comment. Um, we are going to do a session for students, likely a video too, and have info on Creative Commons licensing on the LibGuide for the course. Wonderful. So, yeah, um, I'll just add, um, there are also lots of um, comments and suggestions for the guide. So just in case we can't address them all, I am making note of them so that we have a record from this conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen, because I don't want to miss anything. Um, yes, students can transfer their copyright over to anybody. I love the point about transferring it to the institution rather than to the faculty member for whatever reason. Maybe they move on to another place. Maybe they no longer have an interest in pursuing this project. Um, the transfer does not need to happen. And that was the conversation that I had with this faculty member who wanted the students to transfer all their rights over. I said, ethically, not only do I have problems with endorsing this, but it's not required. A Creative Commons license is absolutely sufficient in this situation. 
Um, something we talked about is if the student chooses to put a Creative Commons uh, no derivatives license on their work. And the faculty member had some concerns about, well, that means that we can't make changes into the future. And I said, well, no, not necessarily. We can always go back and speak with that student and get their permission. Of course, we can always consider fair use where our particular use might not fall within the scope of that particular license. But if that's what the student wishes, I feel that we need to respect that for whatever reason. So what we are pushing is encouraging students to attach a Creative Commons license. Um, but the Office of General Counsel and I, for the most part, are expressly against the idea of the students transferring their copyright over to the faculty member. Um, we're kind of on the fence about the institution. But the one place where we see institutional ownership is a work made for hire situation with a student employed either by the faculty member creating the OER or by the library. Um, so with our OER publishing program, we have a budget that could allow the faculty member to hire a graduate student to help them create content. And in that situation, because they would be formally hiring that graduate student, we would view that as a work made for hire situation in which Miami University would likely own the copyright. Now that said, the student would be fully attributed as the creator, but the copyright would be owned by Miami University. Um, with internally our library publishing program, I can't draw a stick figure to save my life. I have to be one of the most horrific artists out there. So when it comes to something like art or graphical content, we are going to hire a student to work on that. Um, number one, because I'm horrible at it. And number two, I love any educational opportunity or employment opportunity that the library can provide. Number one, to let our students, like graphic design students, put what they're learning to use, but also to let them maybe later during an interview talk about real world experience working with the client through this job with the library. I got to work um, with these faculty who were creating OER and then also to get their name in that publication. So for students we would hire to create graphical content, again, Miami University, because of the work made for hire situation, would hold the copyright, but the students would absolutely be credited as the content creators. Um, so outside of work made for hire situations, I see no reason whatsoever students should have to fully transfer their copyright over. Um, and, uh, I think I'm forgetting the second part of that question. Let's see. There were two questions. I think I lost the thread too, Carla. Please carry okay. on. But Creative Commons licenses, again, are great. It's something we're going to talk about down the road is especially when we want our users to understand um, you know, what rights do they have, what reuse rights. Um, if they say a Creative Commons license, they know they can operate within the scope of that. If they see copyright so-and-so institution or so-and-so individual, I think that's when we start to see the hesitations about reuse rights. So Creative Commons are wonderful for our student creators. So one of the primary ways we have contents for open educational resources is that self-created content. Another option is, of course, public domain works. I was working with um, a graduate student recently, and I said, you know, well, one thing we can consider for your thesis or dissertation is public domain works. And they're like, isn't that really, really old stuff? Some of it is really, really old stuff. When we have that context of the copyright term expiring, um, but some of it is newer, wonderful, and engaging stuff. And I think this is especially um, where we see the option of Section 105 of U.S. Copyright Law those works created by employees of the US federal government. Um, so the student I was working with was looking to refresh PowerPoint presentations for their department. It was in the biology department and she wanted to know what can we reuse, um, because we're also gonna share these slides online, that we don't have to worry about copyright. So we talked about images created by the CDC, by the NIH, these federal government agencies, that their works are in the public domain by matter of law that we can freely, freely reuse these, not only in PowerPoints, but in OER publications as well. Um, sometimes we see, well, actually more frequently, we see individuals who are getting grants from these federal agencies 
that are being required as part of their grants to openly license works created from that. Um, so that could be articles, it could be presentations, it could be data. Now, those are a little bit different in that they are openly licensed, usually under Creative Commons license. They are not in the public domain, meaning they have no copyright protection whatsoever. But because they are frequently licensed with Creative Commons licenses, we can act within the scope of that license to bring it into our open educational resource. So one of the faculty members I work with who transitioned from a art history textbook to a website that she created um, for her students to use, old public domain stuff was wonderful. She was teaching art history. So we have thousands upon thousands of art images that are now in the public domain that we could incorporate into her website. But we also have things that are in the public domain by matter of law, and these we can incorporate into our open educational resources as well. Um, so this is something that I hope to highlight in this book too, um, excuse me, this guide too, is the options for reusing public domain works. Erin, any questions before we move on? We have uh, about a dozen questions, Carla. Um, and I'm not sure if any of them are specifically re related to public domain, which you just covered. I'm trying to tackle a few of them, um, you know, uh, typed out. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the others I'm, I'm saving, but I do want to share one particular uh, use case. Please. So um, uh, one person had an instructor of French creating an intermediate French language and culture textbook. She wanted to use many of her own photos, some of which were complicated in terms of copyright. For example, photos of museum exhibits and artworks where the art was in the public domain photos of consumer products, for example, packages of chips and candy, and photos of advertisements in metro stations. So tricky stuff there. Maybe. I love this question because it shows how complicated it can get. Um, so our initial thought is, well, they took the picture. They're the rights holder. They are the rights holder of the picture, but then there's underlying copyrighted works within that picture, like an advertisement, um, like a work of art. So here in the United States, if they take a picture of a public domain work of art, um, they would have copyright in that picture, but because the underlying work of art is in the public domain, they are free to share that picture as they wish. But if it is something like um, maybe a sculpture, something newer that does have copyright protection, now we have to think a little bit more about the underlying copyright in that particular work and that coming through in the picture that they took. Um, that's one of those situations where maybe there's user exceptions in the law we can think about, like fair use. It's a situation where maybe we can go get permission from the person who owns the copyright in the statue or the artwork to share their work. It could be a situation where we go see if the rights holder has made um, open access or created images of that work online that we can share instead. Um, so there's all these different options that we can work through when looking to share that particular thing. The same with an advertisement. Um, an advertisement is going to have copyright protection as well. And if we really want to drill down deep, if there's maybe a celebrity who is in that advertisement, it could be that they have rights of celebrity that is separate from that advertisement that we need to think about a little bit. Um, again, we have options available for us. How have they made it available online? Is there a way that we can incorporate it into the OER that maybe takes into account open licensing? Could we pursue permissions or an independent license for the use of this? Depending on what context is it being used, can we consider fair use? And I'm bringing this up because we are going to talk about fair use and open educational resources in depth on Thursday. We will dive into that in depth on Thursday. It's its whole presentation for a reason, because um, I don't want to say it's very controversial, but it's, it's the option available to us for reusing third party works that I think we get the most questions about. So we wanted to dedicate a whole session to the considerations tied to that. Um, so yeah, I think that's a perfect illustration of the person is this um, rights holder in the photograph, but there could be works incorporated into it that we need to think about copyright considerations as well. But there's almost always options for that. Cool, thanks Karen. 
So um, another option for incorporating um, third party works into open educational resources is Creative Commons works. The fabulous thing about Creative Commons works is we have those clear license terms in regards to how we can reuse a work. Um, now, sometimes CC works do get a little bit muddled. Um, so, for example, if it's share alike and we use a photograph, does that now mean our whole entire OER has to be share alike? No, it does not. Um, but uh, CC photographs take some of the ambiguity out of it. We know that if we use the work within the scope of the license terms, that we are free to incorporate it into our OER. Um, what CC license works can we use in our OER? Almost any type. The only time that um, I have a little bit more of a conversation with a faculty member looking to reuse a Creative Commons work is when we are looking at something that's um, licensed under maybe a no derivatives license or a share alike license. With a no derivative license, if they don't wish to make any changes to it, we don't necessarily have a lot of concerns in front of us. With share alike, it's also more often that confusion that, oh, I really want to use this, but then my whole entire OER has to be share alike. Nope, only the work if you change it. Um, one of the considerations we have though, of course, here is verifying the CC licenses. Um, that unto itself is kind of maybe um, a whole section of this guide that when somebody is sharing a CC license work, how do we make sure they really are the rights holder? So my favorite example of this, and I wish I would have put it in the slide, was somebody came to me with a picture of Dr. Seuss's Grinch and they said, look, it's shared under a Creative Commons license. I can reuse this. And the person who had shared it with the Creative Commons license was like Bob Smith. And I was like, I don't think Bob Smith is the rights holder in the Grinch. Um, so, you know, I'm pretty certain Dr. Seuss's estate is. So while I appreciate Bob Smith trying to put things out there, he didn't have the rights to put this license on the creative on this picture because he was not the rights holder. Um, that was a very obvious situation. Sometimes it's not necessarily so obvious to us, but what are some thoughts that go into this process? Um, and then tracking the CC licenses. I worked with one faculty member, bless their heart, who uh, gave me a folder full of about 40 images and they said, oh, they're all Creative Commons licenses. I checked but we didn't have any documentation of that. Um, so having that conversation with our OER authors up front about how do we go find Creative Commons images, the Creative Commons works that we can incorporate into our OER, and how do we track those licenses, not only so we can give the proper citation with our, within our OER that is required by the license, but making sure that we can show if needed that good thought, um, work and effort to verify those licenses. Um, Karen, any questions or thoughts or stories people have shared about reusing Creative Commons works? We do have, um, let's see, when working with CC by text, it often becomes confusing how far back an attribution should go. A recently published OER text might rework material from a previous textbook which had its own authors. If I'm adapting the more recent textbook, I'm sometimes not sure whether to go back and locate the original authors or just refer to the more recent adaptations. So sort of these, these layers of modifications that happen as an OER exists in the world for a period of time. I love that that was brought up, um, especially because it's something we hadn't thought about for this guide. So it's another thing we can make sure we include in there. Um, the answer for that, I think, is it depends. Um, I think personally how I would handle that um, is citing the source that I am working from. So um, if I am working from a OER text um, where Karen reused somebody else's CC BY work, then I would probably cite uh, Karen's work, which is where I'm getting the information from. But if the original work that Karen was citing was authored by Sarah Cohen, then I would probably bring that into the conversation as well, that this is CC BY, adapted by a work created by Karen Lawrenson, adapted from a work created by Sarah Cohen. Um, I, I tend to prefer to do that just to kind of show the history of the document or the history of the evolution, but also to make sure everybody is getting credit for what is being brought in. Although depending on how you're using it, um, of course, Sarah cited, excuse me, Karen cited Sarah in terms with the um, CC license. So hopefully that would come forth as well when I was then citing Karen that we would kind of see that chain. Now, 
It is my understanding that the CC license does not necessarily involve that much tracking back. I believe that you are just supposed to cite. You are generally citing the work that you are working from. Um, so maybe just citing Karen's work. It's, it's one of those things where you would probably want to take a look at the CC license in depth and what are you comfortable with. Um, but I personally try to go back as far as I can. Now, if it's something Karen cited from Sarah that was cited by Barbara, um, you know, and we all of a sudden have like eight or 10 different names in it, that might get to be a little bit overwhelming. Um, but I would say at least cite the work that you're working from and then try to go farther back, maybe within what you feel is comfortable and reasonable, or at least that's what I would do. Thanks, Carla. We have a question also about the share alike license. Mm -hmm. If a faculty member wants to remix some works and one of the works has a CC by SA license, which contains copyright content, how is that handled? I understand the CC license aspect, but I'm unclear about the copyright content within the CC work. So I want to double check to make sure I'm understanding this question correctly. Say we are talking about um, a video that somebody is creating, an OER video, and part of that is um, music that was licensed under share alike license, and they want to remix that music before they incorporate into the PowerPoint. Um, are you talking about the larger PowerPoint in general and how that share alike license might then impact the larger PowerPoint or just the remixed music? Um, I hope that example is helpful, um, and, and I think this is one of the challenges with share-alike licenses, is where does that share-alike license translate up to? And the example that I just gave, um, if the music was licensed under CC by share-alike and they remixed it, the remixed music should be shared under the same license, but that will not necessarily apply up to the whole entire PowerPoint itself. Um, and that's where I see a lot of the confusion with these licenses. So um, please share a little feedback with Karen if that kind of helped answer your question or if you can give us more detail that can allow me to better answer that question. I also have a comment. Uh, we had a situation working with animation students. We explained to them they had kept copyright excuse me, and we had them sign a form assigning a Creative Commons license to the material. It happened to be an ND license. I found their instructor was very worried about open licensing because of concerns regarding protecting the student's works, but he ended up being supportive in the long term. Good, good. Um, and I think that's definitely something to consider as well. Um, yeah, we definitely need to include this in the guide as another consideration for students. I was just this morning talking with a graduate student about um, copyright in her thesis or dissertation. And you know, when I was hearing your example, I think especially at the graduate level where we see students who, it's very much a practice to take their thesis or dissertation and then later turn that into scholarly articles or books. Um, you know, sharing those works at that level under Creative Commons licenses or just sharing them in general may have considerations for publication down the road there are some publishers who will say we will not accept your work for publication if it has been published elsewhere before. Um, so I think that is another ethical consideration to bring into this for students. Um, maybe in an animation class they are creating some type of cartoon character or something else that they could see translating into you know a comic strip or something else a movie down the road tied to that character. And then um, how could the sharing of that impact that? So I love this. This is exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, few things that we need to work into the guide, situations that you've seen on the front lines that we want to make sure we talk about. Um, so when other person, other people encounter these questions that uh, they have some background information to work on. And Carla, related to your Bob Smith story, uh, we have an attendee who says, my biggest concern is verifying. Mm -hmm. I found some Creative Commons license quiz questions on a well-known repository. A faculty member recognized a few of them from a proprietary textbook package. We Googled several of them and found matches to two or three copyrighted packages. So if I do that with other Creative Commons licensed works we're adapting and I only find it out there with other open sources, have I done enough to verify that 
there's proper use here and, and we're doing an okay thing? That's a tricky question to answer because that almost borders on legal advice and I am not an attorney, but I can tell you that I generally do exactly what you did. Um, I, I, I try to work within good faith to the extent that I can to verify things. So when um, either I find a Creative Commons image that I'm interested in using, or I'm working with a faculty member who is interested in using them in their OER, we start with, where did we find it? Did we find it via Google? Did we find it via the CC beta search? One of the first things we do is go to that um, author's Flickr account or wherever they have those hosted and kind of take a look like, okay, does this stand in line with other things that they have posted there? Is this really an amazing, beautiful image? And everything else there looks a little bit amateur. Um, we started doing some reverse image searches to see maybe are there other places that we can find this. And there have been a few situations where we track it to somebody else's um, Flickr page or Instagram page or something like that. Um, there have been times where I have emailed people and said, hey, we found this Creative Commons work, um, you know, here, we see that you are the rights holder. We're so excited to incorporate this into an OER that we're creating. We just want to double check um, to make sure that you are the rights holder and to verify how you would like to be attributed in our work. Um, a couple people have never written me back, whatever we want that to mean. The vast majority of those people in the situations have been like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in a textbook. This is so exciting. Do you want some more pictures? So it's a great way to engage with people as well. Um, when we look at copyright law, it very frequently talks about, you know, making a good faith effort or to the extent technologically reasonable. Um, reasonable. I hope that nobody ever finds themselves in a situation where they are in court over the incorporation of something, a Creative Commons work used in an OER um, because it was mislabeled. But if I would find myself in that situation, what I want to be able to do is say, Your Honor, I made the best faith decision that I could. I just didn't find it on Google and snatch it up and assume that everything was right. I tried to track the image down. I tried to do a little bit of homework. I tried to reach out. And I'm sorry that a mistake was made, but you know, I was working within the context of the information that I could found online and I tried to do my best to verify that. So it sounds to me like the work you're currently doing to verify is very similar to the work that I'm doing and that I know other people are doing to verify CC resources. Thanks, Carla. Uh, here's a question um, related to that. If the author is the copyright holder of the OER textbook and we are asking permission from a photographer to use his photograph, should we ask him to issue the permission to use his image to the author or to the institution? That is a great question. And the answer is it depends. Um, they may feel more comfortable granting the license to the author. And in the end, we try to work with what the rights holder is most comfortable with. In those situations, we at Miami University ask that the rights be granted to the institution um, for whatever reason. Maybe that author moves on to another institution and we no longer have contact with them. Maybe we are seeking to make a future edition and um, while that faculty member is still very interested, they don't necessarily have the time at that moment to work on revising. If we know the license is granted to the institution, then we can work within that license grant of the institution and not necessarily having to go through that faculty member. Um, so I know in those situations, I always try to get the rights grants to the institution for more flexibility. Great. And related to the good faith effort that you explained, um, is there a way to document it or do you take notes or what kind of um, record keeping might you do? I take notes. Um, so I have a little spreadsheet and okay, where did I initially find this? Google image search, you know, CC beta. Um, where did I go to their Flickr page or wherever? What is that web address? You know, what did I find there? Um, you know, if I reached out to them to e, uh, ask questions to verify ownership, keeping those emails in a folder in my email account that's headed up by that OER project. Um, so I try to document whatever I can. Um, and it doesn't have to be, or at least I don't keep in-depth notes, usually just URLs and a few notes about what I found there or uh, what I saw. Um, and then when I feel pretty comfortable that the licenses are legitimate, I print to a PDF. So just in case that web page goes away, I have everything saved within that PDF that has a timestamp of it of what I found at that time. Cool. 
Um, so I noticed we're getting close to one o'clock. It's, it's uh, time does fly when you're having great conversations. And thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. I think what I want to do is sprint through a few of my slides and then save the last five or six minutes for questions. Um, obtaining permission. We've already been talking a little bit about this. Um, it can be broad, it can be narrow, um, it can be tied to one OER project, it can be in conjunction to any works created with these open educational resources, so video, PowerPoints, things like that. Um, this process involves identifying the rights holder, crafting the request, documenting the permission granted, and then using the work within the scope of that. Permissions can seem daunting, but um, I have had so many successes with permissions and the vast majority of people that I work with, especially independent creators, are so excited to hear that you are reusing their work and maybe find ways that they can contribute to the project, either through a case study or additional images. Um, so permission is definitely one thing we should consider. Sometimes obtaining a license. Sometimes we go pay for the use of a work within the scope of an OER. And if that, that is what best fits the situation, um, well, then it's definitely something to consider. Again, identifying the rights holder, contacting them. Here, the rights holder tends to be maybe a little bit more in control of the rights that they are offering you, and you have to see if that works within the scope of your project. With a license, very frequently, there is going to be a license fee and how does that fit within our budget. And then uh, working within the terms of that license. Fair use. Of course, this option underlies all CC licenses. Um, it's an, also an option for reusing um, other third party works. More to come, um, not just our conversation on Thursday, um, but many things that are coming out in regards to this, like a best practice within the scope of copyright and OER, all the conversations that are going on around this. And then of course, license communication. How do we communicate these licenses to the people who are using their OER and help them understand what they can do? CC licenses, again, tend to be pretty easy. Um, except where sometimes they can be confusing, like share alike or no derivatives. Um, so CC licenses, whether that's how we're licensing the OER we've created in general, or those sub-licensed third-party works, making sure that they are properly cited in compliance with the license. Let's help people clearly understand their rights. I know a conversation we're having right now is in regards to placement. Do we just place those CC licenses on the website where people go to get that work? Are they just on the title page? Are they tied to every work? Do we have a pictures page where we cite all the CC works? Do we have a CC license on every single page um, or every other page? Um, I think there's considerations about how those are considered. Could they get lost as OER works are being mixed? Um, but CC licenses, again, are the easy options for communicating rights to um, the users, whether it's the OER in general or that third party content. I think one of the big questions that come along is when we are reusing um, public domain works, how do we communicate that out, especially as the public domain status can be different in every country. In the United States, works pass into the public domain generally 70 years after the passing of the author, although there's some nuances to that for work made for hire or anonymous works. In Canada, it's life plus 50. In Mexico, it's life plus 100. So what might be in the public domain in the United States might not be in the public domain in Mexico, and how do we communicate that to people who might be using the OER so they understand their reuse options? And of course, with things like permissions or licenses or fair use, but that the permission I received to use this work doesn't necessarily translate to permission how you might want to use the work. Or if I am considering fair use, my fair use isn't necessarily your fair use. Um, there's a lot to think about here about how we communicate this out so our users can make thoughtful determinations of the law as well. So in this guide, right now what we have outlined is some information about the basics of U.S. copyright law to help people understand how our rights secured, um, how long does copyright last, joint authorship considerations, work made for hire considerations, the types of works that are eligible for copyright protection, um, rights that are granted to the authors, and then how else can we share these rights out? What other, what other, whatever other, what information do you want to see besides this in our copyright basic session? For the public domain section, how do we find public domain works? How do we maybe make a thoughtful determination of the copyright status of a work? What else would you like to know here? For openly licensed works, we will be focusing on Creative Commons licenses since that's what most people use. 
How do we find CC works? How do we determine our reuse options? How do we track where we found those so that we can thoughtfully communicate those licenses to users? What else do you want to know about Creative Commons license works? Obtaining permission. How do we do this? How do we track down the rights holder? How do we start a conversation with them? How do we negotiate for rights? How do we draft the agreement? Because I think here, even though in these situations we don't definitely need something in writing, it's good to have something in writing. Um, so some sample permissions letters. What else do you want to know about this process? Fair use, tune in next time. Um, definitely more of a conversation on this. What I'm also so eager to obtain from you is exactly what you have been sharing here. Your experiences, um, where you've specifically dealt with these situations in OER creation. Um, you know, I think it's one thing to talk about all of this, but where I think we learn best is when we hear the situations we have all dealt with, how we work through those, how we handle those, and what came out of them. So one feature of this guide, we want to be case studies frontline stories from you all about how you work through these issues and what your experiences have been. So if you would be interested in contributing to that, we have a forum where you can share your thoughts on this guide, what you want to see in this guide, but you can also volunteer to be a case study author. So we have seven minutes left, um, though I can stay on a little bit past that if this session permits that. Um, to share your questions here, to share your questions or thoughts through this URL, um, or if you can't tell, I'm so excited about this project, not just to be working with the OTN, not just to be able to work on a guide um, that talks about information that I enjoy, but to get this information out there. Um, these issues can be overwhelming, but there is so much work that we have done as a community that can help people figure out what are the key issues here and how can I thoughtfully work through them. And I am so eager to be working with this community on it. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me uh, via email as well if you want to talk about any of this. Thanks so much, Carla. So we still have some questions here for you. There have been a few questions related to um, whether or not authors or institutions own the work. And that, of course, depends on the institution. Would you say that it's more common for authors or institutions to own the work? The vast majority of what I personally have seen is that the authors hold the copyright in the work. Now, of course, the Creative Commons license that they attach to, um, attach to it can allow the institution options for alternate formats down the road um, for making revised editions. Um, I have seen some institutions where the copyright in the work is transferred over to the institution. That is usually so that if revised editions or alternate formats want to be made in the future, that the institution is very empowered to do that. Um, but as part of that contract, very often the author is granted back full rights to reuse that work however they wish. I have seen some MOUs or publication agreements tied to OER. Um, so for example, the MOU we will be using here at Miami University, we're actually calling it a publication agreement because it's become a little bit more formal, where the author is the rights holder, but they grant the right to Miami University to make any type of adaptions, modifications, um, basically any rights we need under the law to create future versions. If, for example, um, they're not able to update a version of it, that we can find somebody else to do that or have the options to do that ourselves. But I would say 90% of what I've encountered that the author or authors retain the rights. Thank you. And then there's a couple questions about housekeeping and documentation. So if you have obtained permission to use a work, is an email with sufficient documentation is that, is that enough or do you need a signed document, something a little more formal? And related to that, do you have a template of a spreadsheet where you verify copyright that you would be willing to share? Yes. Um, so generally an email will be enough. Some institutions do do more like formal publication, like, um, you know, I'm granting you the permission, sign on the dotted line. So usually what we're getting for OER is permissions. They are allowing us to make this particular useful. They retain full rights. So that's what we call a non-exclusive transfer. I'm not giving you all of my rights in the work or all of this particular publication right. I'm saying you can use this in this capacity. 
And under the law, we are not required to have that in writing. That said, I absolutely get those in writing, especially when it comes to publication. Um, I may talk with them by phone, but what I'll say afterwards is let me get your email address because I want to send you an email with everything you talked about to make sure I understand everything correctly, that we are properly citing you. We want to make sure we use this in compliance with what you talked about because we are so grateful that you granted us this permission. I will kind of type out everything that we said. I include a little bit language that, you know, you said that you are the rights holder in this. Um, and that, you know, if you have any questions, any concerns with anything I've outlined here, if I've misconstrued anything, please respond letting me know where those errors are. Um, I like to have that documented because that way, if there's ever a question down the road, we can go back to that email or to that document. Um, so I use emails. Um, some people want a little bit more for formal permissions letters, and um, I'm happy to do that too. And yes, I do have a template that I will be happy to share with you. Um, it's an Excel spreadsheet that basically says, what are you calling the work? Who's the rights holder? What are the different communications? What is the name of the permissions file? Uh, I can get that to Karen to share out with a copy of my PowerPoint. Thanks, Carla. There have been a few questions about attribution, so I just want to point people to the Creative Commons website because it has really helpful information on how best to attribute works. We had a great question, which I appreciate, on how to do that in a visually pleasing way so that the license uh, doesn't interfere too much. And I don't have any uh, guidelines on that, but I do understand that it's a little bit tricky. I think we can squeeze in one more question. We will need to end on the hour in order to okay. prepare for our next session. Um, this one is related to visuals. Mm -hmm. How can one evaluate the copyright status of graphs, diagrams, and visualizations of scientific processes? For example, I work with some OER creators who want to reuse diagrams and graphs that are classic in the field of thermodynamics. My advice usually is to ask if the figure can be reproduced differently while conveying the same information. If yes, I recommend they create their own figure. If not, I consider it to be factual information that cannot be copyrighted. What is your opinion on this? It depends. Um, so you're absolutely right that facts cannot be copyrighted. However, the expression of facts can be copyrighted and that could include um, a chart or a graph or some other visualization. So kind of working through the copyright decision tree that I use um, is does, is the work protected by copyright? That's one of our first questions. Um, so if we wanna look at some things in the public domain, if this is kind of a very classic representation in the field of thermodynamics, can we find a representation of it that um, has passed into the public domain in terms of its copyright expiring? Can we go to a US federal government agency and find a representation of this that they have created that is in the public domain by nature. Um, if the work we are uh, looking at likely is copyright, say it was public copyrighted, say it was published in a recent edition of a um, journal, um, then you know who is the copyright holder? Can we go to them to get permission? Um, I think another thing here is can we create a representation of it ourselves? So if we're looking at something like a pie chart, that pie chart would be eligible for copyright protection, but those data points in it are not. Can we take those data points and create our own representation of that particular data um, to use? So it's one of those where we can kind of work through different options um, to see what might we be able to uh, incorporate. Um, it might not be the exact one that we originally wanted to use, but can we find an alternate version or can we create our own version? Thank you, Carla. And thanks to everyone who submitted their great questions, tips, and case studies. It's been a vigorous and exciting conversation. Carla and I are both excited about incorporating your input into the upcoming copyright guide. And we hope to see you on Thursday when we'll talk about related issues and fair use. So thank you again, Carla. Thank you to everyone for attending the Open Textbook Network Summit. A recording will be available and emailed to everyone who registered for this session. And we look forward to seeing you in the coming days. Farewell. Thanks, everybody.